Lord of the Land. Gene Wolfe. The Nebraskan smiled warmly, leaned forward, and made a sweeping gesture with his right hand, saying, Yes, indeed, that's exactly the sort of thing I'm most interested in. Tell me about it, Mr. Thacker, please. All this was intended to keep old Hop Thacker's attention away from the Nebraskan's left hand, which had slipped into his left jacket pocket to turn on the miniature recorder there. Its microphone was pinned to the back of the Nebraskan's lapel, the fine brown wire almost invisible. Perhaps old Hop would not have cared in any case. Old Hop was hardly the shy type. Wall, he began. This was years and years back, the way I heard it. Guess it'd have been in my great-grandpa's time, Mr. Cooper, or maybe before. The Nebraskan nodded encouragingly. There's these three boys, and they had an old mule. Wasn't good for nothing except crowbite. One was Colonel Lightfoot. Of course, didn't nobody call him Colonel then. One was Creech, and the other un... The... Old man paused, fingering his scant beard. Yes, I don't rightly know. I did know. It'll come to me when nobody want to hear it. He's the one had the mule. The Nebraskan nodded again. Three young men, you say, Mr. Thacker? That's right. And Colonel Lightfoot. He had him a new gun. And this other one... He was a friend of my grandpa's or somebody. He had him one everybody said was just about the best shooter in the county. So this here, Laban Creech, he said he wasn't no bad shot himself, and he went and fetched his and He was the un that had that mule, I recollect now. So they led the old mule out into the matter, maybe fifty straddles from the break. You know how you do. Creech. He shot it smack in the ear, and it just laid down and died. He was old and sick, too. Didn't kick or nothing. So Colonel Lightfoot, he fetched out his knife and cut it up the belly, and they went on back to the break for to wait out the crows. I see, the Nebraskan said. One would shoot, and then another, and they'd kept score. And it got to be near to dark, you know, and Colonel Lightfoot, with his new gun, and this other man had that good un. They was even up, and this Laban Creech was only one behind him. Reckon there was near to a hundred crows back behind in the gully. You can't just shoot a crow and leave him, you know, and expect the rest to come. They look and see that dead un, and they say, Well, just look what become of him. I don't calculate to come anywhere near there. The Nebraskan smiled. Wise birds. Oh, there's all kinds of stories about them, the old man said. Thank you, sir. The granddaughter had brought two tall glasses of lemonade. She paused in the doorway to dry her hands on her red and white checkered apron, glancing at the Nebraskan with shy alarm before retreating into the house. Didn't have a lick back then. The old man poked an ice cube with one bony, somewhat soiled finger. Didn't have none when I was a little and neither, till the TVA come. Nowadays you talk about the TVA and they think you mean them programs, you know. He waved his glass. I watch them sometimes. Television, the Nebraskan supplied. That's it. Like... You take when Bud Bloodhead went to his reward, Mr. Cooper. Hot, you never seen the like. The birds all had their mouths open. Wouldn't fly for anything. Lot two hogs, I recollect. That same day, my pa, he wanted to save the meat, but it wasn't a bit of good. He says he thought them hogs were rotten for ever they dropped, and he was afraid to give it to the dogs. It was that hot. They was all sleeping under the porch anyhow. Wouldn't come out for nothing. The Nebraskan was tempted to reintroduce the subject of the crow shoot, but an instinct born of thousands of hours of such listening prompted him to nod and smile instead. Well, they knowed they had to get him under quick, didn't they? 
So they got him fixed, cleaned up and his best clothes on and all like that, and they was all in there listening. But it was terrible hot in there, and you could smell him pretty strong, so by and by I just snuck out. Wasn't nobody paying attention to me, you see. The women's all bawling and carrying on, and the men thinking it was time to put him under and have another. The old man's cane fell with a sudden dry rattle for a moment. As he picked it up, the Nebraskan glimpsed Sarah's pale face on the other side of the doorway. So I snuck out on the stoop. I bet it was a hundred easy, but it felt good to me after being inside there. That was when I seen it coming down the hill to the other side of the road. Stayed in the shadow much as it could, and looked like a shadow itself. Only, you could see it move, and it was always blacker than what they was. I knowed it was the soul sucker and was afeard it'd get my maw. I took to crying, and she come outside and fetched me down the spring for a drink, and that's the last time anybody ever did see it, far as I know. Why did you call it the soul sucker? The Nebraskan asked. Cause that's what it does, Mr. Cooper. Guess you know it ain't only folks that has ghosts. A man can see the ghost of another man, all right, but... He can see the ghost of a dog or a mule or anything like that, too. Wall, you take a man's, cause that don't make so much argument. It's his soul, ain't it? Why ain't it in heaven or down in the bad place like it's supposed to be? What's it doing in the haint house or walking down the road or wherever twas you seen it? I had a dog that seen the ghost one time, and that, hmm, was another dog's. You see, I never did see it, but he did. And I knowed he did by how he acted. What was it doing there? The Nebraskan shook his head. I've no idea, Mr. Thacker. Well, I'll tell you. When a man passes on, or a horse, or a dog, or whatever, it's supposed to get out and get over to the judgment. The Lord Jesus Christ's our judge, Mr. Cooper. Only sometimes it won't do it. Maybe it's a feared to be judged, or maybe it has this or that to tend to down here yet, or anyhow reckons it does. Like showing somebody some money what it knowed about. Some does that pretty often, and I might tell you about some of them times. But if it don't have business and is just feared to go, It'll stay where it is. That's the kind that haints their graves. They belong to the soul sucker, do you see? If it can get him. Only if it's hungered, it'll suck on a live person. And he's bound to fight or die. The old man paused to wet his lips with lemonade. Staring across his family's little burial plot and fields of dry corn stalks to purple hills, where he would never hunt again. Don't win. Not particular often. Guess the first one was an Indian, maybe. Something like that. I tell you how Crete shot it. No, you didn't, Mr. Thacker. The Nebraskan took a swallow of his own lemonade, which was refreshingly tart. I'd like very much to hear it. The old man rocked in silence for what seemed a long while. Whoa, he said at last. They'd been shooting all day. Reckon I said that. For a good long time, anyhow. And they was tied. Colonel Lightfoot and this here Cooper was. And Creech just one behind him. Twas Creech's time next. And he kept on saying to stay for just one more. Then he'd go and they'd all go. Hit or miss. So they stayed. But wasn't no more crows cause they'd about killed every crow in many a mile. Started getting dark for sure. And this Cooper, he says, Come on, lab. Couldn't nobody hit nothing now. You lost, and you got to face up. Creech, he says, Well, twas my mule. And just about then, here comes something bigger than any crow and black, hopping along the ground like a crow will sometimes, do you see? Over towards that dead mule. So Creech ups with his gun. 
Colonel Lightfoot, he allowed afterwards he couldn't have seed his sights in that dark. Reckon he just sighted alongside the barrel. Tis the old mountain way, you see, and there's lots what swore by it. Well, he let go and it fell over. You won, says Colonel Lightfoot, and he claps Creech on his back and lets go. Only this Cooper, he knowed it wasn't no crow, being too big, and he goes over to see what twas. Well, sir, twas like to a man, only crooked-legged and wry neck. Twas no man, but like to it, you see. Who shot me, it says, and the mouth was full of worms, grave worms, do you see? Who shot me? And Cooper, he said, Creech. Then he hollered for Creech and Colonel Lightfoot. Colonel Lightfoot says, boys, we got to bear this. And Creech goes back to his home place and fetches a spade and an old shovel, them being all he's got. He's shaking so bad that they just rattle together, do you see? Colonel Lightfoot and this Cooper, they seed he couldn't dig, so they goes hard at it. Pretty soon they looked around and Creech was gone, and the soul sucker too. The old man paused dramatically. Next time anybody seed the soul sucker, twas Creech. So he's the one I seed, or one of his kin anyhow. Don't never shoot anything without your dead sure twat tis, young feller. Cued by his closing words, Sarah appeared in the doorway. Supper's ready. I set a place for you, Mr. Cooper. Paul said, you sure you want to stay? Won't be fancy. The Nebraskan stood up. Why, that was very kind of you, Miss Thacker. His granddaughter helped the old man rise. Propped by the cane in his right hand and guided and supported by her on his left, he shuffled slowly into the house. The Nebraskan followed and held his chair. Pa's washing up, Sarah said. He was changing the oil in the tractor. He'll say grace. You don't have to get my chair for me, Mr. Cooper. I'll put on till he comes. Just sit down. Thank you. The Nebraskan sat across from the old man. We got ham and sweet corn, biscuits and potatoes. It's not no company dinner. With perfect honesty, the Nebraskan said, Everything smells wonderful, Miss Thacker. Her father entered, scrubbed to the elbows, but bringing a tang of crankcase oil to the mingled aromas from the stove. You hear all you want to, Mr. Cooper? I heard some marvelous stories, Mr. Thacker, the Nebraskan said. Sarah gave the ham the place of honor before her father. I think it's truly fine what you're doing, writing up all these old stories for they're lost. Her father nodded reluctantly. Wouldn't have thought you could make a living at it, though. He don't, Paul. He teaches. He's a teacher. The ham was followed by a mountainous platter of biscuits. Sarah dropped into a chair. I'll fetch your sweet corn and potatoes in just a shake. Corn's not quite done yet. Oh, Lord, bless this food and them that eats it. Make us thankful for farm, family, and friends. Welcome the stranger neath our roof as we do, O oh Lord. Now, let's eat. The younger Mr. Thacker rose and applied an enormous butcher knife to the ham, and the Nebraskan remembered at last to switch off his tape recorder. Two hours later, more than filled, the Nebraskan had agreed to stay the night. It's not real fancy, Sarah said as she showed him to their vacant bedroom. But it's clean. I just put those sheets and the comforter on while you were talking to Grandpa. The door creaked. She flipped the switch. The Nebraskan nodded. You anticipated that I'd accept your father's invitation. Well, he hoped you would. Careful not to meet his eye, Sarah added, I've never seen Grandpa so happy in years. You're going to talk to him some more in the morning. You can put the stuff from your suitcase right here in this dresser. I cleared out these top drawers, and I already turned your bed down for you. Bathroom's on past Paul's room. You know, I guess we seem all the country to you out here. I grew up on a farm near Fremont, Nebraska, the Nebraskan told her. There was no reply. When he looked around, Sarah was blowing a kiss from the doorway. Instantly, she was gone. 
with a philosophical shrug. He laid his suitcase on the bed and opened it. In addition to his notebooks, he had brought his well-thumbed copy of The Types of the Folktale and Schmidt's Gods Before the Greeks, which he had been planning to read. Soon the Thackers would assemble in their front room to watch television. Surely he might be excused for an hour or two. His unexpected arrival later in the evening might actually give them pleasure. He had a sudden premonition of Sarah, fair and willow slender, would be sitting alone on the sagging sofa and that there would be no unoccupied chair. There was an unoccupied chair in the room, however, an old but sturdy-looking wooden one with a cane bottom. He carried it to the window and opened Schmidt, determined to read as long as the light lasted. Dies, he knew, had come in his chariot for the souls of departed Greeks, and so had been called the Gatherer of Many by those too fearful to name him. But Hop Thacker's twisted and almost pitiable soul-sucker appeared to have nothing else in common with the dark and kingly Dies. Had there been some still earlier deity who clearly prefigured the soul-sucker? Like most folklorists, the Nebraskan firmly believed that folklore's themes were, if not actually eternal, for the most part very ancient indeed. Gods before the Greeks seemed well indexed. Dead. Their mummies visited by Anuat, too. The Nebraskan nodded to himself and turned to the front of the book. Anuat, Anuat, Lord of the Land, the Necropolis, Opener to the North. Though frequently confused with Anubis to whom he lent his form, it is clear that Anuat, the jackal god, maintained a separate identity into the New Kingdom period. Souls that had refused to board Ra's boat and thus to appear before the throne of the resurrected Osiris, were dragged by Anuat, who visited their mummies for this purpose, to Tuat, the lightless demon-haunted valley stretching between the death of the old sun and the rising of the new. Anuat and the less threatening Anubis can seldom be distinguished in art, but where such distinction is possible, Anuat is the more powerfully muscled figure. Van Allen reports that Anuat is still invoked by the modern Muslim or Coptic magicians of Egypt under the name Jugu. The Nebraskan rose, laid the book on his chair, and strode to the dresser and back. Here was a five-thousand-year-old myth that paralleled the soul-sucker in function. Nor was it certain by any means that the similarity was merely coincidental that the folklore of the Appalachians could have been influenced by the occult beliefs of modern Egypt was wildly improbable, but by no means impossible. After the Civil War, the United States Army had imported not only camels, but camel drivers from Egypt, the Nebraskan reminded himself. And the escape artist Harry Houdini had once described in lurid detail his imprisonment in the Great Pyramid. His account was undoubtedly highly colored, but... Had he, perhaps, actually visited Egypt as an extension of some European tour? Thousands of American servicemen must have passed through Egypt during the Second World War, but the soul-sucker tale was clearly older than that, and probably older than Houdini. There seemed to be a difference in appearance as well. But just how different were the soul-sucker and this Jugu, really? Anuat had been depicted as a muscular man with a jackal's head. The soul sucker had been. The Nebraskan extracted the tape recorder from his pocket, rewound the tape, and inserted the earpiece. Had been like to a man, only crooked legged and wry neck. Yet it had not been a man, though the feature that separated it from humanity had not been specified. A dog-like head seemed a possibility, surely. And Anuat might have changed a good deal in five thousand years. The Nebraskan returned to his chair and reopened his book, but the sun was already nearly at the horizon. After flipping pages aimlessly for a minute or two, 
he joined the Thackers in their living room. Never had the inanities of television seemed less real or less significant. Though his eyes followed to the movements of the actors on the screen, he was, in fact, considerably more attentive to Sarah's warmth and rather too generously applied perfume, and still more to a scene that had never, perhaps, taken place, to the dead mule lying in the field long ago, and to the marksman concealed where the woods began. Colonel Lightfoot had no doubt been a historical person, locally famous, who would be familiar to the majority of Mr. Thacker's hearers. Laban Creech might or might not have been an actual person as well. Mr. Thacker had, mysteriously, now that the Nebraskan came to consider it, given the Nebraskan's own last name, Cooper, to the third and somewhat inessential marksman, Three marksmen had been introduced because numbers greater than unity were practically always three in folklore, of course. But the use of his own name seemed odd. No doubt it had been no more than a quirk of the old man's failing memory. Remembering Cooper, he had attributed the name incorrectly. By imperceptible degrees, the Nebraskan grew conscious that the Thackers were giving no more attention to the screen than he himself was. They chuckled at jokes, showed no irritation at even the most insistent commercials, and spoke about the dismal sitcom neither to him nor to one another. Pretty Sarah sat primly beside him, her knees together, her long legs crossed at their slender ankles, and her dishwater-reddened hands folded on her apron. To his right, the old man rocked, the faint protests of his chair as regular and as slow as the ticking of the tall clock in the corner, his hands upon the crook of his cane, his expression a sightless frown. To Sarah's left, the younger Mr. Thacker was almost hidden from the Nebraskan's view. He rose and went into the kitchen, cracking his knuckles as he walked, returned with neither food nor drink, and sat once more for less than half a minute before rising again. Sarah ventured, Maybe you'd like some cookies or some more lemonade? The Nebraskan shook his head. Thank you, Miss Thacker, but if I were to eat anything else, I wouldn't sleep. Oddly, her hands clenched. I could fetch you a piece of pie. No, thank you. Mercifully, the sitcom was over replaced by a many-colored sunrise on the plains of Africa. There sailed the boat of Ra, the Nebraskan reflected, issuing in splendor from the dark gorge called Tuat, to give light to mankind. For a moment he pictured a far smaller and less radiant vessel, black-hulled and crowded with the recalcitrant dead, a vessel steered by a jackal-headed man, a minute fleck against the blazing disk of the African sun. What was that book of von Daniken's? Ships? No. Chariots of the Gods. Spaceships, nonetheless. And that was folklore, too. Or, at any rate, was quickly passing into folklore. The Nebraskan had encountered it twice already. An animal, a zebra, lay still upon the plain. The camera panned in on it. When it was very near, the head of a huge hyena appeared, its jaws dripping carrion. The old man turned away, his abrupt movement drawing the Nebraskan's attention. Fear. That was it, of course. He cursed himself for not having identified the emotion pervading the living room sooner. Sarah was frightened, and so was the old man. Horribly afraid. Even Sarah's father appeared fearful and restless, leaning back in his chair, then forward, shifting his feet, wiping his palms on the thighs of his faded khaki trousers. The Nebraskan rose and stretched. You'll have to excuse me. It's been a long day. When neither of the men spoke, Sarah said, I'm about to turn in myself, Mr. Cooper. You want to take a bath? He hesitated trying to divine the desired reply. If it's not going to be too much trouble, that would be very nice. Sarah rose with alacrity. I'll fetch you some towels and stuff. 
He returned to his room, stripped and put on pajamas and a robe. Sarah was waiting for him at the bathroom door with a bar of zest and half a dozen towels at the least. As he took the towels, the Nebraskan murmured, Can you tell me what's wrong? Perhaps I can help. We could go to town, Mr. Cooper. Hesitantly, she touched his arm. I'm kind of pretty, don't you think so? You wouldn't have to marry me or nothing, just go off in the morning. You are, the Nebraskan told her. In fact, you're very pretty. But I couldn't do that to your family. You get dressed again. Her voice was scarcely audible, her eyes on the top of the stairs. You say your trouble's starting up. You got to see the doctor. I'll slide out the back and round. Stop for me at the Big Elm. I really couldn't, Miss Thacker, the Nebraskan said. In the tub, he told himself that he had been a fool. What was it that girl in his last class had called him? A hopeless romantic? He could have enjoyed an attractive young woman that night. And it had been months since he had slept with a woman and saved her from, what, a beating by her father? There had been no bruises on her bare arms, and he had noticed no missing teeth. That delicate nose had never been broken, surely. He could have enjoyed the night with a very pretty young woman, for whom he would have felt responsible afterward for the remainder of his life. He pictured the reference in The Journal of American Folklore, collected by Dr. Samuel Cooper, U. Neb, from Hopkins Thacker, 73, whose granddaughter Dr. Cooper seduced and abandoned. With a snort of disgust, he stood, jerked the chain of the white rubber plug that had retained his bathwater, and snatched up one of Sarah's towels at which a scrap of paper fluttered to the yellow bathroom rug. He picked it up, his fingers dampening lined notebook filler. Do not tell him anything Grandpa told you. A woman's hand, almost painfully legible. Sarah had anticipated his refusal, clearly. Anticipated it, and coppered her bets. Him meant her father, presumably. Unless there was another male in the house, or another was expected. Her father almost certainly. The Nebraskan tore the note into small pieces and flushed them down the toilet dried himself with two towels, brushed his teeth, and resumed his pajamas and robe, then stepped quietly out into the hall and stood listening. The television was still on, not very loudly, in the front room. There were no other voices, no sound of footsteps or of blows. What had the Thackers been afraid of? The soul sucker? Egypt's moldering divinities? The Nebraska returned to his room and shut the door firmly behind him. Whatever it was, it was most certainly none of his business. In the morning he would eat breakfast, listen to a tale or two from the old man, and put the whole family out of his mind. Something moved when he switched off the light, and for an instant he had glimpsed his own shadow on the window blind, with that of someone or something behind him a man even taller than he, a broad-shouldered figure with horns or pointed ears, which was ridiculous on the face of it. The old-fashioned brass chandelier was suspended over the center of the room. The switch was by the door as far as possible from the windows. In no conceivable fashion could his shadow or any other have been cast on that shade. He and whatever he thought he had glimpsed would have had been standing on the other side of the room, between the light and the window. It seemed that someone had moved the bed. He waited for his eyes to become accustomed to the darkness. What furniture? The bed, the chair in which he had read. That should be beside the window where he had left it. A dresser with a spotted mirror, and he racked his brain. A nightstand, perhaps. That should be by the head of the bed, if it were there at all. Whispers filled the room. That was the wind outside. The windows were open wide. The old house flanked by stately maples. Those windows were visible now. Pale rectangles in the darkness. 
As carefully as he could, he crossed to one and raised the blind. Moonlight filled the bedroom. There was his bed. Here, his chair. In front of the window to his left. No puff of air stirred the leaf-burdened limbs. He took off his robe and hung it on the towering bedpost, pulled top sheet and comforter to the foot of the bed and lay down. He had heard something, or nothing, seen something, or nothing. He thought longingly of his apartment in Lincoln, of his sabbatical, almost a year ago now, in Greece, of sunshine on the Saronic Gulf. Circular and yellow-white, the moon floated upon stagnant water. Beyond the moon lay the city of the dead, street after narrow street of silent tombs, a daedal labyrinth of death and stone. Far away, a jackal yipped. For whole ages of the world, nothing moved. Painted likenesses with limpid eyes appearing to mock the empty, tumbled skull beyond their crumbling doors. Far down one of the winding avenues of the dead, a second jackal appeared, head high and ears erect. It contemplated the emptiness and listened to the silence before turning to sink its teeth once more in the tattered thing it had already dragged so far, eyeless and desiccated, smeared with bitumen and trailing rotting wrappings. The Nebraskan recognized his own corpse. And it once was there, lying helpless in the night-shrouded street. For a moment the jackal's glowing eyes loomed over him. Its jaws closed, and his collarbone snapped. The jackal and the moonlit city vanished. Bolt upright, shaking and shaken. He did not know where. Sweat streamed into his eyes. There had been a sound. To dispel the jackal and the accursed, sunless city, he rose and groped for the light switch. The bedroom was, or at least appeared to be, as he recalled it, save for the damp outline of his lanky body on the sheet. His suitcase stood beside the dresser. His shaving kit lay upon it. Gods before the Greeks waited his return on the cane seat of the old chair. You must come to me. He whirled. There was no one but himself in the room. No one as far as he could see, in the branches of the maple or on the ground below. Yet the words had been distinct, the speaker, so it had seemed almost at his ear. Feeling an utter fool, he looked under the bed. There was nobody there, and no one in the closet. The doorknob would not turn in his hand. He was locked in. That, perhaps, had been the noise that woke him. The sharp click of the bolt... He squatted to squint through the old-fashioned keyhole. The dim hallway outside was empty, as far as he could see. He stood. A hard object gouged the sole of his right foot, and he bent to look. It was the key. He picked it up. Somebody had locked his door, pushed the key under it, and possibly spoken through the keyhole. Or perhaps it was only that some fragment of his dream had remained with him. That had been the jackal's voice, surely. The key turned smoothly in the lock. Outside in the hall, he seemed to detect the fragrance of Sarah's perfume, though he could not be sure. If it had been Sarah, she had locked him in, providing the key so that he could free himself in the morning. Whom had she been locking out? He returned to the bedroom, shut the door, and stood for a moment, staring at it, the key in his hand. It seemed unlikely that the crude, outmoded lock would delay any intruder long. And, of course, it would obstruct him when he answered. Answered whose summons? And why should he? Frightened again. Frightened still, he searched for another light. There was none. No reading light on the bed, no lamp on the nightstand. No floor lamp, no fixture upon any of the walls. He turned the key in the lock and, after a few seconds' thought, dropped it into the topmost drawer of the dresser and picked up his book. Abaddon, the angel of destruction dispatched by God to turn the Nile and all its waters to blood, 
and to fill the firstborn male child in every Egyptian family. Abaddon's hand was averted from the children of Israel, who for this purpose smeared their doorposts with the blood of the Paschal Lamb. His substitution was frequently been considered a foreshadowing of the sacrifice of Christ. Amit, Amit, devourer of the dead. This Egyptian goddess guarded the throne of Osiris in the underworld and feasted upon the souls of those whom Osiris condemned. She had the head of a crocodile and the forelegs of a lion. The remainder of her form was that of a hippopotamus. Figure 1. Am meets great temple at Henensu, Heracleopolis, was destroyed by Octavian, who had its priests impaled. Anuat, Anuat, Lord of the Land, the Necropolis, Opener to the North. Though frequently confused with Anubis, the Nebraskan laid his book aside. The overhead light was not well adapted to reading in any case. He switched it off and lay down. Staring up into the darkness, he pondered Anuat's strange title, Opener to the North. Devourer of the Dead and Lord of the Land seemed clear enough. Or rather, Lord of the Land seemed clear once Schmidt explained that it referred to the necropolis. That explanation was the source of his dream, obviously. Why, then, had Schmidt not explained Opener to the North? Presumably because he didn't understand it either. Well, an opener was one who went before, the first to pass in a certain direction. He, or she, made it easier for others to follow, marking trails and so on. The Nile flowed north, so Anuat might have been thought of as the god who went before the Egyptians when they left their river to sail the Mediterranean. He himself had pictured Anuat in a boat earlier, for that matter, because there was supposed to be a celestial Nile. Was it the Milky Way? Because he had known that the Egyptians had believed there was a divine analog to the Nile along which Ra's sunboat journeyed. And, of course, the Milky Way actually was, really is in the most literal sense, the branching star pool where the sun floats. The jackal released the corpse it had dragged, coughed and vomited, spewing carrion alive with worms. The Nebraskan picked up a stone fallen from the crumbling tombs and flung it, striking the jackal just below the ear. It rose upon its hind legs, and though its face remained that of a beast, its eyes were those of a man. This is for you, it said, and pointed toward the writhing mass. Take it and come to me. The Nebraskan knelt and plucked one of the worms from the reeking spew. It was pale, streaked and splotched with scarlet, and woke in him a longing never felt before. In his mouth it brought peace, health, love, and hunger for something he could not name. Old Hop Thacker's voice floated across infinite distance. Don't never shoot anything without you're dead sure what tis, young feller. Another worm, and another and each as good as the last. We will teach you, the worms said, speaking from his own mouth. Have we not come from the stars? Your own desire for them has wakened, man of earth. Hop Thacker's voice. Grave worms, do you see? Come to me. The Nebraskan took the key from the drawer. It was only necessary to open the nearest tomb. The jackal pointed to the lock. If it's hungered, it'll suck on a live person, and he's bound to fight or die. The end of the key scraped across the door, seeking the keyhole. Come to me, man of earth. Come quickly. Sarah's voice had joined the old man's. Their words mingled and confused. She screamed, and the painted figures faded from the door of the tomb. The key turned, 
Thacker stepped from the tomb. Behind him, his father shouted, Joe, boy, Joe! and struck him with his cane. Blood streamed from Thacker's torn scalp, but he did not look around. Fight him, young feller! You got to fight him! Someone switched on the light. The Nebraskan backed toward the bed. Pa! Don't! Sarah had the huge butcher knife. She lifted it higher than her father's head and brought it down. He caught her wrist, revealing a long, raking cut down his back as he spun about. The knife and Sarah fell to the floor. The Nebraskan grabbed Thacker's arm. What is this? It is love, Thacker told him. This is your word, man of earth. It is love. No tongue showed between his parted lips. Worms writhed there instead, and among the worms gleamed stars. With all his strength, the Nebraskan drove his right fist into those lips. Thacker's head was slammed back by the blow. Pain shot through the Nebraskan's arm. He swung again, with his left this time, and his wrist was caught as Saris had been. He tried to back away, struggled to pull free. The high, old-fashioned bed blocked his legs at the knees. Thacker bent above him, his torn lips parted and bleeding, his eyes filled with such pain as the Nebraskan had never seen. The jackal spoke. Open to me. Yes, the Nebraskan told it. Yes, I will. He had never known before that he possessed a soul, but he felt it rush into his throat. Thacker's eyes rolled upward. His mouth gaped, disclosing for an instant the slime-sheathed, tentacled thing within. Half falling, half rolling, he slumped upon the bed. For a second that felt much longer, Thacker's father stood over him with trembling hands. A step backward, and the older Mr. Thacker fell as well. Fell horribly and awkwardly, his head striking the floor with a distant crack. Grandpa! Sarah knelt beside him. The Nebraskan rose. The worn, brown handle of the butcher knife protruded from Thacker's back. A little blood, less than the Nebraskan would have expected, trickled down the smooth old wood to form a crimson pool on the sheet. Help me with him, Mr. Cooper. He's got to go to bed. The Nebraskan nodded and lifted the only living Mr. Thacker onto his feet. How do you feel? Shaky, the old man admitted. Real shaky. The Nebraskan put the old man's right arm about his own neck and picked him up. I can carry him, he said. You'll have to show me his bedroom. Most times Joe was just like always, the old man's voice was a whisper, as faint and far as it had been in the dream city of the dead. That's what you got to understand. Near all the time and when... When he did, they was dead, do you see? Dead or near to it. Didn't do a lot of harm. The Nebraskan nodded. Sarah, in a threadbare white nightgown that might have been her mother's once, was already in the hall, stumbling and racked with sobs. Then you come, and Joe, he made us. Said I had to keep on talking, and she had to ask for your supper. You told me that story to warn me, the Nebraskan said. The old man nodded feebly as they entered his bedroom. I thought I was being slick. It was true, though. Except it wasn't Cooper nor Creech, neither. I understand, the Nebraskan said. He laid the old man on his bed and pulled up a blanket. I killed him, didn't I? I killed my boy, Joe. It wasn't you, Grandpa. Sarah had found a man's bandana, no doubt in one of her grandfather's drawers. She blew her nose into it. That's what they'll say. The Nebraskan turned on his heel. We've got to find that thing and kill it. I should have done that first. Before he had completed the thought, he was hurrying back toward the room that had been his. He rolled Thacker over as far as the knife handle permitted and lifted his legs under the bed. Thacker's jaw hung slack. His tongue and palate were thinly coated with a clear, glutinous gel that carried a faint smell of ammonia. 
Otherwise, his mouth was perfectly normal. It's a spirit, Sarah told the Nebraskan from the doorway. It'll go into Grandpa now, cause he killed it. That's what he always said. The Nebraskan straightened up, turning to face her. It's a living creature. Something like a cuttlefish. And I came here from... He waved the thought aside. It doesn't really matter. It landed in North Africa, or at least I think it must have. And if I'm right, it was eaten by a jackal. They'll eat just about anything, from what I've read. It survived inside the jackal as a sort of intestinal parasite. Long ago, it transmitted itself to a man, somehow. Sarah was looking down at her father, no longer listening. He's resting now, Mr. Cooper. He shot the old soul sucker in the woods one day. That's what Grandpa tells, and he hasn't had no rest since. But he's peaceful now. I was only eight, or about that. And for a long time, Grandpa was afraid he'd get me. Only he never did. With both her thumbs, she drew down the lids of the dead man's eyes. Either it's crawled away, the Nebraskan began. Abruptly, Sarah dropped to her knees beside her dead parent and kissed him. When at last the Nebraskan backed out of the room, the dead man and a living woman remained locked in that kiss, her face ecstatic, her fingers tangled in the dead man's hair. Two full days later, after the Nebraskan had crossed the Mississippi, he still saw that kiss in shadows beside the road.